Uh, Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 16. And here's what Jesus had to say in this portion of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, verse 16. Jesus said, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward, but when you fast... Anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. God bless the reading of his word. You now may be seated. All right. Uh, We're talking about prayer, and we're combining it and talking about fasting as well today. And uh, that may be some new territory for some of us. And So that's good. We like to find new things to talk about from the Bible, challenging some new ways, next steps, and this may be a next step for a lot of people today. Also, I'm not going, I'll I'll be around so you can't just skip out because I'm still taking roll, but I'm not going to be preaching next Sunday. We have a special Sunday. Roger Taff will be preaching. Uh, The Sunday after that, doing some Thanksgiving time with family, and then I'll be kicking off the last Sunday of this month, our uh, Christmas series. So, because I'm not going to be talking to you from here between now and Thanksgiving, we're going to talk about fasting just to help you a little bit with whatever damage you're planning to do to your body. Thanksgiving. Yeah, you're not going with this at all, are you? Come on, it's okay. Jesus didn't command fasting, but he assumed fasting. He taught it, is it and when. When you fast. Uh, it's, uh, it's a common practice. You find it all through the Old Testament. You find it through the New Testament. It's a common spiritual discipline. So what you have in the Sermon on the Mount, this is, okay, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, we've said, because we've been in a series talking about being a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ since January. And what we've said is, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you follow Jesus you do the things Jesus did, you, you're going to follow the things he commanded, that he, he, he told us to do. And so that's what it means to be a follower. And fasting falls in this in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. What Jesus is addressing in this section of the sermon, there were some folks that had taken things that were really gifts from God and just distorted them enough to, to throw them off track. And Jesus wants to write where things are off track. He wants to do some correcting. He wants to do some reorienting of some things. And so he says, when you give alms, when you're, when you're giving to provide for the poor, he, throughout the scriptures, God wants us to learn to be a generous people because he's a generous God. It reflects his character. And so in our generosity, he says, when you give, because he's expecting you're going to. He says, when you pray, because he expects we're going to be a people of pray, a prayer. And then he says, when you fast. And that one really throws us for a loop because we're not used to thinking about that as something he expects from us. And yet, it shows up in uh, the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. You find, uh, you find this in the apostles. You find it in the Old Testament prophets. Fasting and prayer combined together. So what is fasting? And it's a much shorter sermon today because we're going to spend a lot of time praying at the end of this hour before we're dismissed. But in, uh, in the short time... I'm going to give you a lot of blanks to fill in in your outline. So you'll feel pretty fulfilled by the time the day's over. Those of you who uh, like filling in blanks to for a sense of accomplishment at church. There's some brave basic principles of fasting. So I want to run through these. Just a quick uh, seven or so things. Here's the first thing about fasting. Because I know this is new territory. We want to define this. Fasting focuses on God and honors him. You don't fast like it's a good luck charm. Like I did this and so now God owes me something. I have... Uh, somehow impressed him with my incredible devotion. We fast because we love God. Now, when I, uh, when I was dating Rhonda, I made all kinds of adjustments to my schedule to be with her. Now we've been married for 30-something years. I make all kinds of adjustments so I can be where she is and we can be together because I love spending time with her. It's not like it's some terrible sacrifice to be with Rhonda. I love being with Rhonda, and I'll rearrange my schedule for that. Fasting says, missing a meal? For a, for a, a meal or a day, that's no big sacrifice because I love spending time with God. And that's what happens during a fast. You take that time you would eat to spend time with God. 
Second thing, fasting has a spiritual purpose. Fasting doesn't exist unto itself. It is always in the Bible connected to prayer. So it's not just fasting. Some, some of you, you've read articles, you've read books. Some of you practice fasting for health benefits. And more power to you in those things. But that's different than biblical fast. It's for a spiritual purpose. And it just, it just helps you to connect with God at a different level. It opens up some things that may have been closed in your heart. It reveals things that needed to be revealed. Uh, that's fasting. It has a spiritual purpose in the Bible. Third thing, fasting causes individuals to humble themselves and submit to God's authority and to his word. And I don't know why God does it that way, but that's what it does in my life. And I've seen it over and over, and I've read other people who said the same thing, that there's something about fasting that you think, I'm in control, I can run my life, I'm okay, and even a short fast for a day or a two-day fast, a three-day fast, especially start pushing into some of those realms. But sometimes even just skipping one meal, fasting for one meal, combining fasting and prayer together, it just shows you, well, I don't, I'm, I got a lot to be humble about. It's not hard to be humble before the Lord when you realize just in skipping one meal, uh, I, I'm fairly deficient to be able to do this by myself. I need I need God beyond what I can do. It just shows how vulnerable you are, how weak you are, and how much ultimately you're going to need God. So it humbles you to hear God's Word in prayer, to hear new things from God's Word, the Bible. Fourth thing, fasting brings individuals to acknowledge and repent of sin. This has also been my experience. Fasting lays me bare before the Lord. And it is something God uses you, you can hide a lot of things in the dark places of your life, just hidden away in the corners. Fasting just brings to light the things that have been hidden away. And you start, in a fast, the things will start coming to the surface quickly. Pride will come to the surface. Anger, fear, bitterness, jealousies, they'll, they'll, they'll come right up to the surface. You find a lot to pray about and a lot of focus for your fasting and prayer time when uh, you practice this. Uh, in... Uh, this little insert, there's a thing on the back, prayer journal. That's one spot where I have found it helpful to write things down during a fast because it illuminates the things that are sin in me, the things that I need to grow in as a believer. And it just shines a light on those things. And if I'll write them down uh, and ask God for forgiveness, turn away from those things, God has a lot of room to work in me. Fasting reveals the things that control us. Now, fifth thing. Fasting demonstrates the depth of our desire when praying for something. Now, like I said, it's not a good luck charm, but it does demonstrate to God, I'm serious enough about this request, this burden in my life, that I'm willing to, to sacrifice something. I'm willing to let this cost something so that I can pursue fully what God wants in me and uh, the burden of, of what I want for someone else. Here are a couple of verses from the Old Testament book of Joel. Here's the praying in faith, uh, passion about prayer. He says, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. A lot of our praying is pretty passive, isn't it? Uh, it we, we just, you know, God bless the missionaries everywhere, amen. When was the last time you had, you had a prayer burden for somebody or something in your life and somebody you know that it just burned hot enough in you that you, it was, it was the crying out to the Lord. For a lot of people who have been believers a long time, they've never gotten to a spot where, say, I, I am desperate for God to work in this area. That's uh, something fasting really helps to focus such things. Uh, in, in my experience, my life. Here's uh, another passage, the second chapter of Joel. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart with fasting and weeping and mourning. Again, there's, there's some places that get to open up and you, you get a whole new passion for your praying when you combine it with fasting. Sixth thing, fasting releases God's supernatural power. It's, it's one of the tools God has given us when we are finding opposition to the will of God. And this is one of those places. Satan is always attacking us. And when you need spiritual freedom, when you're stuck, when you feel... Uh, a sense of bondage in some area of your life. You just say, I just need a spiritual breakthrough, and I'm not getting a, I, I'm not, I'm not overcoming. You know, Satan, 
He loves to cause division, discouragement, defeat, depression, doubt in us. And united prayer and fasting has always been used by God to deal the decisive blow to Satan, our enemy. And when you combine fasting with prayer and apply it to those needs, God, God just has a way of opening up new doors. In uh, the book of Ezra, Ezra was in one of those spots. They were just desperate. They had nowhere to turn except to God, and that's a good spot to be in sometimes. And so we fasted and prayed about these concerns, and he listened. Then in Isaiah 58, really a lot of Isaiah 58, there's a whole, cha- whole first half of that chapter is about fasting and all the different things, the kinds of fast. I think there are nine different things that you can apply to fasting in that chapter. God says, is, this, is not this the kind of fasting I've chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free and break every yoke. You need just some freedom in some area of your life where you just feel trapped, stuck. Fasting and prayer may be the answer to the question. Seventh thing. Fasting deprives our most basic desire for food in order to help us focus on the spiritual desire for God. Fasting brings balance to our lives. What dominates your life? Tell you what, if you can get around to the fasting side of this, uh, you'll find out some of the things that dominate your life. And if you can give up the most basic thing, your, your daily bread, for a meal, for a day, if you give up your daily bread, Jesus, the bread of life, will come, come to light in some whole new ways for you. And I, I really want to encourage you to explore this. Take a step. He'll help you overcome things by his power. Now, here's how a fast works. And just practical considerations. In fasting, we use the time we'd usually apply to eating or preparing meals. We use that time for prayer. And that gives you a block of time. If it's a meal, if it's a day. And then in between, every time you feel hungry. I have an alarm on my phone. And my alarm on my phone reminds me to pray about certain things during the course of the day. So I have a series of alarms that go off on my phone to remind me about certain things to pray about. Well, in a fast, every time you think, boy, I am hungry. My body is telling me I missed a meal or I missed a day of eating. That is is like an alarm to say, and here's what I want to pray about. I need to spend this time in prayer. You deny yourself the the food that is necessary for life in order that you can call on God, who is the source of all life. Now, Here is my core challenge for you in this. As we are looking at the lostness of our our community and the lostness of our world, we just need to set some goals. Good intentions are what 99% of people walk out of church with every Sunday all over the world. I heard a good lesson. I know what I oughta, but we don't do anything with it. And so today, we want to do something. We're going to act on this. And so set a goal. And the goal is? Who do I know? People far from God. How about that? I'd like for you to really focus on that. People far from God. Maybe they're not a believer. Maybe they just drifted a long way from the Lord. Maybe they're struggling in that. But just write down some names. And then set a goal. One meal a week. One day a week. I'm going to spend time in prayer and fasting for that list of people. And here's why this really came to light for me. We did a We did a message about what it means to be a member of First Baptist Church Allen, FBC Allen, uh, a few weeks ago. And we had a commitment card so people could join. A lot of people made a commitment to church membership, to baptism, a lot of other uh, high-level commitments. It was a great day. On the back of that form, there was a place for prayer requests, and many of you took advantage of that. And overwhelmingly, the thing that dominated that list, so many people, pray for my adult children who are far from God. Pray for my parents who are far from God. Pray for my younger kids who are far from God, who are struggling with the relationship to God. Pray for, pray for my neighbors. Pray for my people I work with. You are, and I just praise the Lord for a church that has a burden for the lostness of the people in their circles of influence. And we want to keep growing in that. So there are people you know who don't know Jesus. And I'm telling you, one of the things that happens in this with a lot of folks is they get to that that question, they say, oh, everybody I know is a Christian. 
Because, I mean, like my neighbors, I mean, they don't go to church. They don't ever read the Bible. They don't ever do anything that Jesus said to do. But they're such good neighbors. They're good folks. I'm sure they're okay. No, they're probably going to bust hell open. And so it's not okay. And God put them next door to you because you know Jesus. Write down their name and say, God, I pray for them, for their losses. I'm going to fast and pray for them. And God, please open a door so I can share Jesus with them. I can tell them a Jesus story. I, I can just say what Jesus means to me. I can share that three circles evangelism presentation. That here's the gospel in a simple way that's changed my life. It gives me hope. Uh, all the different ways, but get into that conversation. So write down names. And then some of you, you have great needs. And maybe it's in your life, and maybe it's in someone that you love very much. But it's just big, big stuff. And you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this my focus for prayer and fasting. And I'm going to set my goal of when I'm going to do it and the frequency I'm going to do it, how long I'm going to have this goal going. Maybe it's just between now and Thanksgiving. I'm going to choose a day or choose a meal a week that I am going to pray and fast for this particular need. Or maybe I'm going to keep, keep doing this until God speaks, until God moves. So... Make use, we're not going to ask for these back. This is for you. So you put this in a visible spot. You make it a regular part of your routine. Uh, keep it focused. Here's, that's the core challenge. We're going to pray for the losses of our city, the losses of our nation, the brokenness in our nation, for our families, our friends, our neighbors, the people we work with, that their hearts would open up to the power of Christ. Now, fasting consideration. This is just the practical application part of this. Fasting is hard. I mean, it's, it's easier in concept than it is in practice. It is surprising how on edge you will feel when you miss a meal. Some of you, you know, like you haven't eaten since breakfast and you're already leaning toward lunch and it's 11 to 18 and you're already thinking, well, during the week, a lot of times I eat about now. I'm starting to get hungry now. And you, it really does drive a lot in us. Our appetites drive a lot in us. And, and so it's going to be hard to do this. And it's supposed to be hard. Because it focuses your heart in a different way. It's going to take you in a different route maybe than you've done before in connecting with God. So here's some simple things. Start small. You don't say, well, you know, this, I really do need to practice prayer and fasting. Well, Moses, he went up on Mount Sinai and he didn't eat or drink anything for 40 days and 40 nights. I think that's where I'm going to jump in. That's probably not the place to jump in. That's not the low rung on the ladder. Just choose a meal a week that you say, I'm going to step back for this one meal a week. And I'm going to spend the time, I'd usually spend eating or preparing a meal. I'm going to block a time, and maybe it's just for an hour. And now, again, in fasting, don't, you don't say, so I'm going to block an hour. So from noon until 1 o'clock on Monday, tomorrow, I'm going to pray and fast. Now, at 101, I'm going to eat four cheeseburgers, and, well, that's not quite what we're looking at here. You, you wait until your regular time for your evening meal. That way you have the afternoon, too, that... You are focusing on every time you feel hungry, it reminds you to pray, to focus on whatever uh, God has led you to for your prayer and fasting target. Uh, and again, one meal a day, day-long fast, uh, two-day juice and water fast. And encourage you toward that. Uh, you know, a juice water fast just means you're abstaining from food and other beverage Except for the juice and water, it allows you to get the nutrients you need, the sugar that you need to keep functioning during the day. You want to plan it still. It's not the day, I'm going to run a half marathon today, and oh, I'm going to choose that day as my fast day. Well, that's probably a bad plan. You find, you find the day when it fits into your schedule best for what you're going to be facing in that day. But uh, you want to feel the effects of this. You want, to, you want to feel the hunger of it. That's a part of what the fast does, and you don't want to miss what God has for you in that Second thing, plan what you'll do instead of eating. You know, before diving into this fast, you craft a simple plan. Connect it to a purpose. That's what this card's for, so that you have a target. This is why I'm fasting. I, I've, known, I've preached about fasting periodically through the years and talked about what it does, how it works. And I've had people say, oh, man, I did a fast all day, and it just almost killed me. And all I could think about was, oh, I wasn't eating, and, and oh, man, but I made it through the day. And what'd you pray about? Oh, I didn't pray about anything. I was too busy thinking about how hungry I was all day. Well, that's not, sometimes it's not prayer and fasting. Sometimes you just went hungry. This, this is a focused time, and if you don't have a target, you're not going to get there. So make it a goal wrapped around a specific purpose. Uh, and then 
it is also possible fast from something other than food. That fasting from food is not necessarily for, other, for everyone because of health conditions. Some of you have medical conditions that's going to keep you from doing a food fast and be threatening to your health. So you need to, you need to find something else that you would fast from. However, and the reason I hate adding that to the list, even though that is a factor, is because there are people who go, oh, okay, I'm going to fast for one night this week from binge-watching Netflix. I'm really going to lay it down for the Lord who laid it all down for me. I'm giving up one night of Netflix. Boy, oh boy, I am sacrificing for the Lord. Well, don't just mail it in on your commitments. The reason food is the only fast listed in the Scriptures is because it really gets into your business because it's so foundational to who we are. And it just reveals a lot of heart, and it opens up, though, a lot of heart to hearing from God in whole new ways. And I got all kinds of testimony personally of how God has worked in combining prayer and fasting in my life for specific things that God has laid on my heart and how it, it just adds a new sense of urgency and power to prayer. And so don't run from the food fast because it's difficult, because it, it is intended by God to be difficult. Now, prayer. Here's my fear with prayer. My fear with prayer is that we talk a lot about prayer, but we never pray. You know how that goes? And a lot of you have been in a Bible fellowship group. You've been in a, in a group with Christian friends. And what happens? Somebody says, oh, man, I have this need. And you say, oh, hey, we'll pray for you. Well, saying you will is not the same thing as praying for somebody. Those are two different things. And when it comes to praying, we can also say, I I'm offering up my prayer request. And a lot of people in a group setting will offer up a lot of prayer requests. And then, okay, so that's a lot of prayer requests. So now it's like, uh, dear God, bless the missionaries everywhere all the time. Amen. That's a little different than praying specifically for certain things and for certain needs. Somebody naming, naming your need before the Lord. And we want to do that today where instead of just talking about praying, we're actually praying. And we're praying about kingdom of God things too. I mean, there are needs in your life, Absolutely. There are spiritual needs, absolutely. And we want to pray for some things today. So we're going to block some time to actually, to actually pray. Now, uh, what do you pray about? Everything. Uh, prayer for special guidance. Prayer because it's a time of uh, particular trouble. Prayer for healing and restoration. For relationships to be healed. Pray for people you know who are far from God, spiritually lost, quite possibly. Maybe just in a spiritual struggle just now. Prayer for those living far from God. Prayer for, for health and wholeness. Prayer for the things related to your work. Prayer for encouragement in your discouragements, in your depression, in the struggles. And, and we bury so much of that uh, so, so deep. Like it's not, You're not allowed to talk about... Uh, those needs and yet boy, God those things are on the heart of God for you and he wants us to voice those things to him in prayer and we're going to challenge you to pray about every need of your life and to ask others to pray for you in those needs we, we've said our church is a place where it's okay to not be okay because we're not okay we're all in a struggle we're all carrying burdens. We're a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints and that means that we're going to lift up a lot of things to the Lord together as a church family we, we're going to pray for, goodness, for revival in our land, God's work in our world. Pray for the persecuted church. We're going to go to God with our burdens, with our fears, with our hopes, our dreams, our hurts, our brokenness. Every need, every hurt, everything to God in prayer. Now, when, uh, and we've had prayer times before. We, you know, you've sat in, you've sat in, uh, class before and say okay it's our prayer time what what's your prayer request and we we put we we ask for safe things and it doesn't mean they're not big things or important things at some level but we pray for safe things so i don't want to minimize these things and yet we're just touching the surface of prayer when we say well my cousin's uncle's brother's sister's co-worker has a hangnail we want to pray for that and you get a lot of those kind of requests at church because 
we want, we, we're, probably reveals there's something pretty big going on inside of us. But we're not willing to put it on the table in front of other people, so we, we put something out. We want to get to the something that's deep, deep inside of us today. The things that are really big, the big things. Most adults in America have never had, we've, we found this at such a high level in our outreach into the community, have never had someone else pray out loud for them. It's powerful when you pray out loud for somebody else, when you have someone else pray out loud for you. And, and so we're going to block some time to, to do that just now. I've asked several of our church leaders to assist in this day, and uh, folks are available around the building. You may, you may just go to somebody. You may go as a group. In the first hour, we had groups of people who came together uh, to ask for prayer for specific things. Uh, you, you may come as a family, and a lot of people just kneeling at the, at the steps. Uh, but we'll have folks scattered around the building to be able to pray out loud for you for specific needs in your life. And, and I know how this goes. We sit in this building and we say, well, those other people probably need it, but I have it all together. And I don't want anybody thinking otherwise about me. I want them to think that I have all the answers and everything is going my way. Well, just so you know, we all know we don't have it all together. None of us do. And that's why we need prayer. And so it just takes a, a little bit of effort to get up from where you are and go and say, here's where I need some prayer just now. Here's where I need God to intervene in my life. Here's where I need a breakthrough. Here's where I need God to break some bonds that really have me locked down. So what's going to happen? We're going to have music playing. There'll be verses on the screens uh, to encourage you in prayer. People are going to be moving around. It is okay to move around. It's okay to, to go wherever you want to go, whomever you want to go to, to pray. But we're going to block time for prayer. Now I want to add this in. James wrote this about prayer. He said, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. If he's committed any sins, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. So that said, I'll be over here. Uh, the chairs are set up for this. And uh, we're available. We'll have a team over here that I'll be a part of. We're available to pray for you for healing in those big things that you just need. Uh, you need God's healing touch and we'll anoint you with oil. Nothing magical about the anointing oil. It's uh, a symbolic thing, a symbol in the scriptures of the Holy Spirit of the healing power of God, and uh, that's available to you as well if you'd like to take advantage of that. What's your focus for prayer? What are your great needs? Why don't we just step out from, from our, uh, our closed-off comfort and say, God, I, I need your help, and I want somebody to pray for me about this, about this, about this. And let's see if God might just do some big things and heaven and earth might start moving today for some things that have been stuck for way, way too long.